<laughs> All right. All that for uh, four names and four dates. <laughs> anyway, that's okay. All right, well, welcome. I think this is about the ninth week we've been doing this. Maybe the tenth. Really? Something around there. Wait a minute. I'm going to write it. I read it written down. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine. There we go. Yeah, nine five or six. <laughs> this term. <laughs> anyway, all right, we're doing uh, the descent into Egypt. So let's uh, start with prayer. James, would you be able to open in prayer for us, please? Amen. No. Guess who ran everything off and was very impressed and uh, pleased with himself until he realised that he didn't put any blanks in. Yes. That's right. You can't get it wrong because... All right. So we're at uh, Genesis 37. Let's start there. We might even read a couple of verses. Um... Start with Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. I might have made a mistake there. I had him down as 13. That's what happens when you uh, do chronologies and you get a little way out with your numbers. You have this knock-on mistake. Anyway, so cross out in my notes where I've put 13. It should be 17. Is that 12 to 13? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. So obviously they'd been complaining about something about their father, and... Uh, Joseph dobbed them in, which always makes you popular. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colours. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So, drama's already in the next generation. So, we've been through the generations of the heavens and the earth and then the generations of Adam, Noah, the sons of Noah, Shem in particular, Terah, Ishmael, Isaac, and Esau. And now we come to the generations of Jacob, so the uh, offspring of Jacob. Uh, among those descendants, we focus on Joseph. You can almost see him as the fourth patriarch in a way because uh, he was the one that God used to accomplish his purposes. So while Jacob is the prince with God, back in Canaan, it's Joseph doing great and mighty things in Egypt through the power of the Lord. Uh, however, an important moment in history had arrived. Uh, Jacob's fulfilling his role as a patriarch in Canaan in the line of promise, but the change over to the next generation means that that single line of promise splits into the 12. And it's not just <coughs> one descendant now who has the blessings and the birthright, but it's, it's all 12 of them, the 12 tribes eventually of Israel. The generations of Jacob follow the development of this family as the Lord put the foundations in place for the emergence of the nation of Israel. So uh, timelines, Genesis 37 picks up the narrative about 1738, 1737 BC, and uh, Jacob was born in 1838 BC, so he's about 100 years old, and I've got Joseph at 12 to 13, but uh, we read in the narrative 17, so somewhere I've lost a couple of years, anyway. That, that can happen when you're trying to piece these things together. 
Now, what is Joseph's significance in the Old Testament history? Well, basically, he's got two roles. Uh, firstly, we know the story of him being the catalyst for bringing Is uh, Israel down into Egypt so that Israel could be nourished and become a, a mighty nation and those prophecies of the affliction that Israel would suffer in Egypt would be accomplished there. But uh, the other great role that Joseph plays in the scriptures is that of a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, a number of commentators say that he is the greatest type in the Old Testament of Christ. Uh, one commentator had over 150 particulars where Joseph is a symbol of Christ. So let's go through some of those. Um, Joseph was the beloved son of his father. Joseph was rejected by his own. His brethren wanted to kill him. He was sold for, well, not 30, but 20 pieces of silver. Uh, Joseph was falsely accused of crimes in a legal trial. Uh, lies were constantly told about him. He was uh, in a position between two prisoners, two malefactors, the butler and the baker. Uh, one of those was saved while the other perished. And there's also the association with bread and wine from the dreams of those two. And Joseph was brought out of the depths and exalted beyond measure. Joseph also married a Gentile bride as Christ, also married the church. Uh, Joseph saved his own people, Israel, while also saving countless Gentiles. And uh, one I only noticed this week, Joseph wept. Seven times, actually. A significant number. He also fed multitudes with the bread of life. And uh, even Pharaoh called him the saviour of the world. That's in Genesis chapter 41, verses 45. So uh, definitely, if not the primary type of Christ in the Old Testament. And there are others, of course, uh, Moses, Joshua, David uh, are all types of Christ in various ways, but perhaps Joseph surpasses them all. Okay, the envy of the brethren or the brothers. Uh, let's read a little more in Genesis 37, verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Now really, Jacob, Jacob dreamed dreams from God and now he's rebuking his son for the same thing. Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So Jacob must have thought about it afterwards and uh, made the connections. I've dreamed prophetic dreams. Maybe this boy is dreaming prophetic dreams. Well, that bit of feud between Leah and Rachel uh, continued and, and continued to cause trouble even after Rachel's death. So the next generation, uh, Leah's sons, picked up the uh, enmity. Uh, Jacob didn't help things. He should have known better, but he uh, caused trouble by playing favourites. And uh, this is, again, being a bit forgetful about what had happened in his own family when his, par his parents had played favourites too. Joseph was the favoured son. We all know about the uh, coat of many colours. And of course, if you favour one child, all the others resent it. Um, and he was the youngest, of course, besides Benjamin. 
however, once again, we do see the hand of the Lord moving circumstances, and that's to achieve his will. Um, although it's not a good situation, the point was that Israel would go into Egypt, and this was how it would happen. And uh, we, we look at Joseph, we can see a man, a young man who's a bit naive, perhaps. He just puts it out there and uh, doesn't realize how his brothers are going to react to that. God revealed his future to him in two dreams, the one with the sheaves and the other with the sun, moon and the stars. And uh, when he declared these dreams to his family, of course, his brethren envied him and uh, really their wrath was kindled. So Joseph's brothers would go on to betray him. Not only did they envy him, but they would uh, commit a terrible betrayal. So Jacob's family, we already know this, kept herds, flocks, which meant uh, you've got to move around. You can't stay in one spot. You've got to keep moving the flocks around. So uh, what does it say in Genesis chapter 37, verse 12? Joseph's brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Do we have the... Oh, yes. No. Do we go back one for a minute, Rachel? Or is it forward? No, it must be forward. No, it's not. Okay. I don't know what happened to that map. I did have a map. Actually, there is a map there. So, probably not that far north. Maybe a little further. Yeah, maybe even there. So, Shechem's there. Dotham's there. So, they'd gone north to feed the flocks. Um, now, we might think it's a bit strange that uh, they ranged over... Canaan, really. They're travelling over a fair bit of Canaan, but it would have seemed normal to them. Uh, the distance from Hebron to Shechem is 80 kilometres. What's that, about here to Wollongong? Fair walk. <laughs> Poor sheep. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I've got here Joseph was 15 years old, but um, as I said, I got my numbers a little out, so he's probably 18. Uh, the brothers probably are still in their 20s. Maybe they're just nudging 30. Uh, they were known to the inhabitants of the land when Joseph asked someone who was uh, in the area of Shechem where they'd gone. He knew them and he, he knew where they'd gone. He'd spoken to them. So they would have felt quite secure. And uh, when Joseph went to check on his brothers, uh, he found they'd moved 10 kilometres north up to Dothan. And uh, so he sets off, sets off after them and they see him coming and... Uh, they decide they're going to do something about him while well, Dad's not around. Uh, it's interesting. We can see their heart attitude in their defiance of God's will. They say, we shall see what will become of his dreams. These dreams have been given by God, and they were God's will. And they were going to say, all right, well, if we kill him, let's see these dreams come true. Uh, Reuben was a bit more mature and must have realized that this was really not a good idea, the Long-term consequences would have been terrible and he tries to manipulate the others and he's going to try and save Joseph. But he seems to go missing right when uh, things happen. So we wonder where Reuben went. Uh, Joseph's life is spared probably because they think they can make some money out of it. So they put him in a pit, they have lunch. Um, Judah takes over. Judah is a leader, a natural leader. Uh, and the fact that Judah, what does Judah say? Genesis chapter 37, verses 26 and 27. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it? So he's after profit. If we slay our brother and conceal his blood, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. So there were some Ishmaelite traders who were coming by and uh, Judah says, let's sell Joseph to them. Now, the next chapter, Genesis 38, uh, might be a bit of a reaction by Judah, a bit of a guilty distancing of himself from his father. We'll get to that in a minute. 
The brothers were lustful and fleshly, so when some Midianite Arabs, also known as Ishmaelites, passed by on their way to Egypt, they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And uh, their cruelty and their lack of mercy would later play on their collective conscience. We'll just quickly read Genesis chapter 42, verses 21 to 22. So this is where uh, Joseph's put them under fair bit of strain. They've, he's the ruler of Egypt by now and uh, he's making life very difficult for them and they don't know that he can understand them and so they have a little gossip amongst themselves and uh, verse 21 and they said one to another we are verily guilty concerning our brother. Now this was years ago. This was uh, a number of years ago in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us And we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear, therefore, behold, also his blood is required. So um, they did have a conscience, and they'd done terrible things, and uh, it affected their conscience. Now back to the Ishmaelites. Um, They'd taken uh, myrrh is something which is native to the Arabian lands. So they'd taken some of that up to Babylon. Uh, That's where they got the spices. So they'd done some trading. Then they travelled across the desert highway to Gilead to buy balm. It says uh, that they'd just come from Gilead. And they were taking all of that, what was left of the myrrh and also the spices and also the balm, down to Egypt to make a profit. Uh, Joseph could definitely be sold in Egypt for a lot more than the 20 pieces of silver. So they were happy to take him and, and they took him and sold him uh, down in Egypt. Reuben returns too late to stop the transaction and so the brothers lie to their father. Now, who lied to his father? Jacob is reaping what he's already sowed and the patriarch's misery was complete. Uh, But God was in control and Joseph was sold to Potiphar, which means he who Ra, as in Amun-Ra, gave. And he was a high-ranking military official. Uh, Let's read verses 35 and 36. And all the sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. This is verse 34. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters... Does that seem strange? Women. What daughters? Only Dina is named in the Bible. So there were obviously others perhaps born in Canaan. Uh, it says daughters. Tend to go with the literal. Uh, rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt under Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. In fact, it might be a little early for granddaughters. Um, Judah certainly didn't have any grandchildren at this time. Uh, Judah hadn't even gotten married by then. So maybe a little early for granddaughters. All right, here's this strange chapter, Genesis 38, the breaking and making of Judah. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a strange chapter, but it has an important purpose. It details the founding of the royal tribe, which would produce King David and the Lord Jesus Christ. It also fills in, now I've proposed the number 24, it seems to fit pretty well, but that's not an exact number. It fills the 24-year gap between when Joseph was sold into slavery and when the brothers went down to Egypt. In fact, In my estimation, it fills it almost exactly. He pretty much leaves as soon as Joseph is sold into slavery and he comes back just before they go down into Egypt to buy grain. So Judah is away a long time. After leading the brothers into selling Joseph, Judah no longer wanted to stay with his father. Uh, Disaffected and troubled, he sought fresh pastures. He became friends with a prominent local, uh, Hira the Adulamite, 
and married a Canaanite woman named Shua. We see that in Genesis 38 verses 1 to 2. Now she bears him three sons, and I think in quick succession. The first, his name was Ur, married a Canaanite woman named Tamar. Tamar means date palm. Uh, he was probably about 20 or 21 years old, but uh, he was wicked. Maybe he'd picked up the practices of the Canaanites and God slew him, Genesis 38 verse 7. Uh, it's interesting, God put a bit of a firewall between the wickedness of the Canaanite and the children of Israel. So the worldliness of the Egyptians did infect the Israelites, but the uh, wickedness of the Canaanites was not allowed uh, to do the same thing, at least not in this era. There's Brother Onan, who by the time that uh, he was uh, required to do this, had probably got to the age of about 21, uh, he was obliged to marry Tamar and raise up seed to his dead brother, but he rebelled against his responsibility, and so the Lord killed him too. Now, let's think about sowing and reaping. Judah had deprived his father of a son and now Judah was deprived of two sons and he was also learning about the lessons of what happens when you hang around with the wrong people. He shouldn't have been hanging around with the Canaanites. Abraham and Isaac both avoided the Canaanites. His third son Shelah was probably somewhere between about 17 and 19 years old when Onan died so Judah promised Tamar that she could marry Shelah when he grew to manhood, so probably only a couple of years. Uh, and then when those couple of years came to pass, Judah balked at fulfilling his promise. Now, why was that? Why did Judah not give uh, Shelah to Tamar? He said he would. <laughs> Last time I gave you a son of mine, <laughs> and the time before. Yes, so uh, I think he saw her as cursed. Bad luck, much worse. Uh, and then Judah's wife dies about this time. And uh, we all know the story of Judah was going up to the, the shearing and uh, Tamar disguised herself because she'd seen that Sheila had not been given to her. And uh, she sat by the way, pretending to be a prostitute. Uh, Judah did not realise who she was, got her pregnant. And uh, then he's in quite the situation. He would either have to condemn a woman whom he had wronged. So he'd wronged her and now he would have to condemn her to be burned to death, alive. Or he would have to confess his faults and be humiliated in front of the Canaanites. Now, to his credit, Judah was honest. Judah did say she is more righteous than I. See that in Genesis 38, verse 26. And then he took Tamar and the twins that she bore him, along with Shelah, back to live with Jacob. And uh, at this point, Judah was a broken man, which is actually good news. That's the sort of man which God can use. And he arrived back just in time to go with his brothers. Now, I'm not saying the day before, but maybe a couple of months before, go with his brothers down into Egypt to buy grain for the family and there they would have to confront Joseph. Uh, in this confrontation, and we won't go through the story because I'm sure you know it well, um, you know, the back and forward and the, the money's found in the sacks again and all that. Uh, and of course, Joseph sets the whole thing up so they have to bring Benjamin and then Benjamin gets caught with the, uh, the goblet and, uh, and now they're really stuck. He puts them in a situation where they are stuck. Once again, Reuben would prove to be useless in a crisis, but when all was seem, seemingly lost, Judah would stand up. He would show leadership, shining forth with dignity, humility and self-sacrifice. He basically said, let the rest of them go, I will stay and be your prisoner. Uh, interesting side note, like Leah and Rachel, Tamar also gets a mention when the elders in the gate at Bethlehem blessed Boaz and Ruth. Ruth chapter 4 verse 12, And let thy house be like the house of Phares, 
whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So the uh, area around Bethlehem, I think, had an association with Phares, and uh, that's why they gave that blessing. Zerah and Phares were twins, and at birth Phares was a bit like Jacob. Um, so Zerah put his hand out first, but um, then Phares beat him to it, uh, supplanting his brother. Phares is in Matthew's genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 1, verse 3. Well, back to Egypt, having uh, sorted Judah out. And of course, Judah had to be sorted out. He's the royal tribe. Back to Egypt, Joseph entered Egypt. I've got as a 15-year-old, probably 18-year-old, 17, 18-year-old. Uh, we know he stood before Pharaoh at the age of 30. It says that in Genesis chapter 41, verse 46. And uh, I'm just setting a timeline here. Jacob later entered Egypt after the seven good years and two of the bad years had passed. We see that in Genesis chapter 45, verse 11. Now, I've got Joseph at 39, probably 42 at this point. Uh, but it is 1708 BC because uh, Jacob is 130. We know that. So 1708 is when Jacob entered Egypt. We don't know how long Joseph served Potiphar for before his, uh, Potiphar's wife made the false and vexatious allegation against him. Uh, perhaps seven years, something like that. Uh, he would have been a grown man by then, early to mid-20s. Uh, if Joseph was in prison for, I don't know, five or six years, uh, before he interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. Uh, and then two more years before Pharaoh had his two dreams. Uh, we get to Genesis 41 verse 46. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now I think, uh, I think we can be quite precise about those two years. Genesis 41 verse 1, and it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. So it was definitely two years after Joseph interpreted the dreams for the butler and the baker. Well, as I say there, we cannot be sure that this chronology is exact, but it's pretty close. Uh, everything's in place, and we can be sure of one thing. God promoted Joseph. Everywhere that he was placed, the Lord prospered and blessed him. I've given some verses there you can have a look at. Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 to 5. Chapter 39, verses 21 to 23. Chapter 40, verses 3 to 4. Chapter 41, verses 41 to 45. Continually talking about Joseph being blessed. Uh, he went into Egypt as a slave and within 15 years he was in the place of Pharaoh himself. What did Pharaoh say about that? Verse 39 of Genesis 41, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house. Now remember, Pharaoh means great house. So he's basically saying, you are de facto in the position of being Pharaoh. And according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have put thee over all the land of Egypt. So I've gone even further. Um, the Lord prepared the way before Joseph. In fact, it was God who sold Joseph into slavery. Joseph himself said to his brothers, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Now, if God meant it unto good, that means that God must have done it. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. So sometimes the ways of the Lord uh, may not seem like what we want to happen, but it turns out to be right. Well, there were four dreams uh, that... Joseph interpreted in Egypt. Seems that God sent dreams to Joseph in pairs. Two for him, 
two for the prisoners, two for Pharaoh. As the Lord's prophet, Joseph was able to interpret all of these dreams and having been proven right when interpreting the dreams of the butler and the baker, uh, Joseph still had to wait two more years until God perplexed Pharaoh with two dreams which disturbed him beyond measure. And of course, uh, at that point, the butler, oh, that's right, <laughs> I know somebody. Um, he directed Pharaoh to Joseph and so there's a quick wash, hasty shave, new clothes and all of a sudden he's gone from the prison to the palace. Uh, the Lord helped him again because as Joseph had said to the butler and the baker, do not interpretations belong to God. Genesis chapter 40 verse 8. Uh, the dreams of the butler and the, and the baker were about their own personal destinies but these dreams... Uh, a pharaoh were about national, even international significance. Uh, as far as the butler and the baker went, one would be restored, the other would be executed. But we should also see uh, some typology in the butler, butler's dream and the baker's dream surrounding the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have crushed grapes, which yielded fresh wine, speaking of Christ's blood which was shed. Uh, the broken bread speaks of the body of the Lord, which was broken at Calvary. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 say? This is my body, which is broken for you. Three branches, three baskets, three days in the tomb. As for Pharaoh, uh, his dreams concern the destiny of all the inhabitants of Egypt and the surrounding areas. Seven years of great terrible famine for the next seven years. And there is the faint whisper of the tribulation here, which is also a seven-year period. Now, we must be a little careful because this Pharaoh actually favoured Israel, whereas the Antichrist will try to destroy Israel. <clears throat> but in the Bible, Pharaoh is a, um, a general type of the Antichrist. I'll, I'll just quickly read you verses out of Ezekiel. This is Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 1 to 5. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus, say, <coughs> excuse me, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. But I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick under thy scales. Now this sounds a lot like Job, the Leviathan in Job. And I will bring thee up out of the midst of thy rivers, and all the fish of thy rivers shall stick under thy scales, and I will leave thee thrown into the wilderness. Now, Pastor Hall's been going on about a certain uh, creature in the wilderness that's head was broken, the Leviathan, the Antichrist, and all the fish of thy rivers, thou shalt fall upon the open fields, thou shalt not be brought together nor gathered. I, will, I have given thee for meat to the beasts of the field and to the fowls of the heaven. And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because uh, they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. So Pharaoh is a general type of the Antichrist. So we've got Pharaoh, the Antichrist, ruler of Egypt, the world, during a period of seven terrible years, famine, and that fits an interpretation of uh, typology of the tribulation. Well, Joseph was elevated from the prison to the palace. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 1. And so it was with Pharaoh. Have you ever thought about how absurd this situation is? He's just pulled a prisoner out of the prison, put him in front, they've put him in front of Pharaoh, He's given an interpretation for a dream. How do they know it's true? 
and they've decided to make him pretty much Pharaoh. Only with the hand of God will that happen. The Lord had set up the whole situation and now God's Holy Spirit testified to the king's heart that Joseph was telling the truth. That is the only reason that Pharaoh did what he did. There's no other way he would have done that besides God putting it on him very strongly that this is what you need to do. The Lord then prompted Pharaoh to make Joseph the de facto ruler of Egypt. We read those verses. I didn't read the next few verses which have the royal ring, the fine clothes and the Usek golden collar. You've seen that in the pictures of Egypt, that big, it, it's quite wide. It says chains and if you look at it closely, yes they are chains but the, uh, the full effect looks like a big collar. Uh, these are all familiar to those who study ancient Egypt. Joseph would collect boundless grain. As I say, they stopped counting it. There was so much. They just didn't bother with counting it. Just quickly shove it into a warehouse, build another one. Quickly, quickly, the seven years will be up. Uh, during the years of plenty, and uh, he distributed it to the people in the seven years of famine. Uh, so I've got the time frame for Joseph standing in front of Pharaoh at about 1717 BC. Now, we don't know the Pharaoh, we don't know the dynasty, we didn't, even the kingdom itself, whether it's the Middle Kingdom or the uh, little intermediate period between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. None of this is known. It's like one of those things where God does something and all the records just seem to disappear for the secular historian. You've got to believe the Bible, otherwise there's very, very little uh, left. Uh, Egyptologists postulate an intermediate period between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom and we'll get to the Hyksos in detail next week and they certainly fit into that period but the exact details are elusive. There's a lot of argument amongst the scholars about exactly what happened and who fits where and that sort of thing. The Hyksos who would arrive about 90 years later are usually given the credit. I like this one. The Hyksos brought the chariot to Egypt. Said, what did we read? Or did we read it? Maybe we didn't even read it. Genesis 41, verse 43. The Bible says that Pharaoh made Joseph to ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried before him, bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. So uh, when in doubt, trust the Bible. The chariots were around before the Hyksos. Uh, we know that Joseph's job was to collect the grain and then administer it. And um, Pharaoh gave him a new name, Zaphnath Pa'anea, which means the saviour of the world. That's in Genesis chapter 41, verses 45. And he would live up to this name. He would save them all. This is another confirmation of Joseph's place as the preeminent type of Christ in the Old Testament. Pharaoh also gave Joseph a Gentile bride, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, just as the Lord Jesus Christ has a Gentile bride, the church. Uh, Joseph would have two sons, Manasseh, which means forgetting because he wanted to forget his former life, and Ephraim, which means fruitful because now he was being fruitful in the service of Pharaoh. He acknowledged the fruitfulness which the Lord had granted him. That's in Genesis chapter 41, verses 50 to 52. Uh, Joseph's father-in-law was the priest of Ra, who had responsibility for the town of On. The town of On was also called the House of Ra. So this is the religious headquarters of uh, the sun god. The Greeks later called it Heliopolis, which means city of the sun, and its ruins are near Cairo. Um, I've just speculated, but the Egyptian pharaoh may have been Sobek Hotep, although there were a couple of them. So. Uh, if that's the case, then Joseph served under the 13th dynasty pharaohs, Sobek Hotep, uh, Wahibri Ibayu, and Mune Fere I. They'll be in the test next week. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, the interesting thing is there was a very prominent vizier who's named in, in, there are some records of this period, 
who's named in the records. And uh, maybe that's Joseph, maybe it's not. Because this is an era of Egyptian history which lacks widespread documentation or artifacts. Uh, the slightly earlier records are much better and the historians regard the Middle Kingdom as the golden age of Egyptian culture. Uh, so Joseph comes in at the end of that. It's also a great irony that while Joseph saved Egypt towards the end of the Middle Kingdom, or just after it ended, he also unwittingly enslaved the Egyptians to their pharaohs. Because when there was nothing left to buy the grain with, they sold their lands and then they sold themselves. And that actually set up the societal conditions for the better known New Kingdom era where Pharaoh owned everything and everyone. So we see that uh, occurring through Genesis 47 verses 13 to 26. Uh, another interesting thing about the New Kingdom period, which is after the Exodus, is that the priests of Amun wielded great power. And the reason for that is that uh, they were not caught up in their sale of the land and the people to Pharaoh because they already had uh, their provisions supplied by Pharaoh, so they didn't have to sell themselves. And so uh, in the New Kingdom, the uh, priests of Amun were the great power brokers um, because of their wealth. All right, why don't we have a, a break at this point? We're back in about 10 minutes.